guys, it's Christian Danforth here, here at Generations North Church. We just wanted to take a second and thank you for joining us online today. We're so excited you chose to be with us. We hope that you take something away from the sermon today and that you just open your heart and mind to what God might have to say to you. Just thank you so much again for being with us, and we hope that what you take away today is life-changing. Let's jump in and let's read these verses together. It says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? Sorry. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Man, I know a traveler engaged a guide to take him across the desert area. When the two men arrived at the edge of the desert, the traveler looking ahead saw before him a trackless, uh, trackless sands without a single footprint, path, or marker of any kind. Turning to his guide, he asked in a tone, tone of surprise, where is the road? With a reproving glance, the guide said, I am the road. So too is the Lord our way through unfamiliar territory. And we're talking about him being the way, the truth, and life today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, today I ask you to uh, please speak to our hearts. Please, Lord, just let me hide behind your cross. Your words are what transform, not Josh's, so don't let me speak. Let it only be you, and if there's anything of me, stop it before it can come out of my lips. As Isaiah said, Lord, I have unclean lips, so we ask you to purify my lips today. Let it be your words, your transformational words, Lord. And let our hearts be softened. Ezekiel 36 says, Lord, and I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I'll move the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So we ask today, Lord, to move our heart of stone, our hardened hearts, and give us a heart of flesh so we can hear your word and be willing to respond to your call and follow your will in our lives, Lord. We pray in your holy name. Amen. We do, in this verse right here, when we're looking at this section in John, we do see a, a transition than what we have seen before. In the past, it has been very, uh, Jesus has been in crowds proclaiming truths, like, I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. And the Pharisees have been there. There's been some uh, uh, correcting on their beliefs. At this time, this is a scene change. This is, if we were in a play, this would be like part two of what's happening. Part three would be, him dying on the cross. And in part two, you see it kind of begin, it starts bringing into intimacy with the disciples alone. Uh, before this, you'll see that's when the Last Supper happened, that we do communion and remembrance of, feet washing. And specifically right before this, this is that time where Jesus says, you know, I'm going away. You, don't, you can't go where I'm going. And Peter says, I'll go anywhere you go. I will die for you. And Jesus says, no, Peter, not only will you not go where I go, and not only will you not die for me, you'll deny me three times before the rooster crows. So we see this is right there. You also see an interesting note that I think it's purposeful is before he starts talking about the summary and calling his uh, disciples into that deeper relationship with him, preparing them for what was to happen, Judas, the one who was betraying him, has been dismissed from the group. So now it's 11 of them who are dedicated to Jesus alone. So here we do see that Jesus is comforting the disciples. He's reminding them of who he is and preparing for what is about to happen again. Because, think about this, Peter, James, John, Andrew, were probably, it's, it's most likely that they were not, like all the 12 disciples appeared at the same time. That's probably not likely. It's not like how we read the events. Boom, 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 boom. It's very likely that those four had spent a lot of intimate time with Jesus before the rest. And Peter, in a lot of ways, was seen as that leader, as you can see. The kind of He's the one that seemed to be the, the mouthpiece for them a lot of times. So you think about the significance 
of Jesus saying that the one who is closest to Jesus out of the three, the three, James, you know, John, and, and Peter, the ones that even went up to the Mount of Transfiguration, saw these intimate relationship. So Jesus brought when he was in the garden praying right before his death, and this person has that relationship with him. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. So when he's talking about comfort in this, he's not just comforting Peter. Because the disciples are going, if Peter, this one dedicated to Jesus, is he saying that he will deny me? What about us? So you see in this way, he's bringing comfort to them. He talks about a peace that we'll look at. He's telling them, I am the way, the truth, and life. And he's laying out a lot of things they have heard. But it seems that sometimes you have to see, not just hear. And that's, I think you see a lot of, he talks about seeing throughout this, seeing. And as we look at this today, I just want to point, I just want to try to break down that statement of what Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And today, that, that is my goal. And again, John is an evangelistic gospel. So the purpose of what Jesus is saying here and what John is writing is so that you may believe. So we look at this about the way. The first thing we have to understand is when, what he's saying here is that Jesus is the only way to God. And in our culture today, this is very counter-cultural. We have this idea of what the word is called as universalism, that every road leads to God, that if God is loving, why would he condemn anyone to hell? Which we've talked about last few weeks is not that God condemns anyone, but their unbelief is what condemns them. They condemn themselves. But here, Jesus is stating, I am the only way to God. I am the only way. There's only one road to God, and it's paved by what it's about to happen with the cross. So in this, this is an idea that no other belief system can get to God except believing in Jesus. None of our works could get us to God except the works Jesus did. So we see here a very plain, a very bold statement that our culture doesn't like. Jesus is the only way. He is the only way to God. There is not any other way. And if we try to go another way, all other roads besides Jesus lead to hell. Just saying it bluntly. And you have to understand in this that not only is he the only way, but there's the exc exclusivity of the way. I like the way one of my favorite uh, pastors says it, Warren Wearsby. He says, Jesus does not simply teach the way or point the way. He is the way. In fact, the way was one of the early names for Christian faith. Our Lord's statement, no man come unto me, but by, uh, come unto the Father, but by me, wipes away any other proposed way to heaven. Good works, religious ceremonies, costly gifts, etc., there's only one way, and that way is Jesus Christ. He makes a very blunt, very statement that we must take. When Jesus says, and we're going to talk about this later, if he's the truth, he makes statements. That means they are true. And he says, I am the only way. So in understanding this, we have to understand that there is exclusivity to the way. Not that God is cutting out anyone, but that he's saying, you must go this way to me. Again, it's not based on works. If it was based on our works to get to God, we would not need Jesus to die on the cross. It is only by believing in Jesus that one is restored to God and one can look hopefully to heaven. So you have to understand that. He is the way, and the way to him is by believing. As Jesus has been saying, believe in me, I'll give you eternal life. Believe. So there's one way. There's only one way to get on that path as believing. But when we're on that path, there's also comfort of the way. Again, Jesus is comforting disciples here because he told Peter, their leader, that, he was going, that Peter was going to deny Jesus three times. So, man, they were in a place of probably uncertainty here. But as we look at this, I think we find many reasons for comfort one, and I love this, salvation is not based on us, but on Jesus. Guys, if salvation was based on us, we would live in a world of uncertainty. We would live in the world of trying to earn a place with God. But the beauty 
is that because we could not earn it, Jesus died on the cross for us. It's by him. So the way to God is reliance solely on Jesus to get you there. It does not matter what you've done. It does not matter what you're doing now in this moment. What matters is that Jesus said, I am the way. And if you believe on me, you'll have eternal life. There's no shame in the gospel. There's no legalism in the gospel. He is saying plainly, I am the way. And there's comfort in that because if it was relying on us, we never could get to God. But through Jesus, we can. So there's comfort that salvation's based on him and not us. There's another comfort as we are believers, that we can look hopefully towards heaven, an eternity with the Lord. Because this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. And a lot of times, the chaos of this world, the sinfulness of this world, this world's not a great place. Think about where we are right now in our society. What is going on in the world out there? But when we are faced with those chaos, faced with sorrow, we can look hopefully towards heaven, and it brings comfort to us. And third, there's comfort that we have the Holy Spirit now here instructing us, comforting us, leading us. It says in John 14, 15 through 7, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Guys, when you look at this passage, John 14, and you start counting repetitions of words, know here is one of the most used words throughout John 14. And it's talking about this intimacy we now have. We're going to get into this. But he's saying here, the world cannot know him. But through Jesus, he not only, we do not only know him, but he remains with us. And we will be in, he will be in us. So there's a constant relationship now. So we have a comforter, the Holy Spirit, who resides in us. And he's there. It says in 25, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and remind you of everything I have told you. He instructs us. Man, it's wonderful when you think about this idea. We talk about heaven. We define heaven as residing in God's presence for eternity. Something that we have to think about is that kingdom of God. He says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. If we define the kingdom of God as where the presence of God is, if the fact that the Holy Spirit resides in every believer, that means we are living in heaven on earth. He resides in us. So we are already in that intimate relationship. So when we talk about hope, we have to understand that there's a past hope to us now, hope from the cross of being restored. There's a future hope. We look hopefully to being perfected, completed in God when he returns in a relationship in heaven for eternity. But right now we have hope because we are already in the presence of God. We already have a relationship. His spirit resides in us constantly. So there's hope and comfort there. And four, Jesus has given us his peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding, found when we lay our lives at his feet in total reliance. Again, it says in the beginning of this one, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it was not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I may be, where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I'm going. He's saying, I've already taught you this. But when you look at mansions, I'm sorry, that old hymn, I have a mansion just over the hilltop. It's misunderstanding. It's talking about a place of abiding for eternity. Abiding place. And this idea is in heaven, we will be in the presence of God constantly the presence of god the father constantly worshiping him it's an amazing idea but we find peace in jesus he tells us later to his disciples he says peace i leave with you my peace i give to you i do not give to you as the world gives don't let your heart be troubled or fearful man he's saying i give you peace paul says this in philippians 4 
Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Don't be wise in your own eyes. He says, you know, uh, petition with thanksgiving. Lay your prayers down with petition with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, as we lay it down at his feet, surpasses all understanding in Christ Jesus. So the idea is when we lay our worries at his feet, it says don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. The peace of God will surpa- that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind. He's saying when you lay it at his feet, there's a peace that only comes from Jesus. And one of my favorite parts about this is what he says in this chapter is we are not orphans, but children of God. He says in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, but I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live and you will live too. And guys, that's amazing. We are not orphans. We are children of God. So in that way, I understand we're no longer orphans. There's comfort there. We are children of God. We are his beloved. He also makes a statement about the truth. In a discipleship journal, author Mike Stiles, Max Stiles tells a story of how he led a young man from Sweden to Christ. One part of their conversation is especially instructive. The young man said, I told you if I decide to follow Jesus, he will meet my needs and my life will get very good. You know, that seemed a point, that seems to uh, this young man to be a point in Christianity's favor. But I faced a temptation there to make it sound better than it is. I said, no, it's not the case. The young man blinked in surprise. I said, actually, you may accept Jesus and find that life goes very badly for you. What do you mean, the young man asked. Well, you may find that your friends reject you. You could lose your job. Your family might oppose your decision. There's a lot of bad things that may happen to you if you decide to follow Jesus. But when Jesus calls you, he calls you to go the way of the cross. The young man stared at me and said, then why would I want to follow Jesus? Sadly, this question is what stumps many Christians. For some reason, we feel that unless we're meeting people's needs, they won't follow Christ. Yet this is not the gospel. I cocked my head and answered, because Jesus is true. He was not just a good teacher anointed by God for a certain calling. He wasn't a man alone. Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. He is God and was God in the flesh. It's God submitting to the form of man to pay the price for your sins that you cannot pay yourself. That is the truth. Because we know his words are truth. So when we look at the idea of Jesus being God, that means Jesus is perfect. And since he is perfect, that means everything we read that he said, everything Jesus said is total and absolutely true. There's a wonderful assurance and comfort found when the believer understands that Jesus is perfect. That he cannot lie. And since he cannot lie, all the promises and and the things he taught will absolutely come true. What joy to look not just with hope at the future, but with bold expectation, knowing that what he says will happen. He will return. We are restored to the Father. That through him, we have eternal life. We can have bold, bold expectation. Jesus is absolutely true. There's no relativity here. It's not that we can, as ourselves, decide what our truth is, what our reality is. He's given us the reality, and that is he's the only way. He's the only truth, and he's the only true life. So here there's the belief that we must have that is founded on this truth. We must make sure that our belief is based not on our works but on him. When we base our believing on us, that's when we're left unassured, easily shook, and in doubt. But when there's a wonderful, but there's a wonderful assurance when we grasp salvation, and that it's based solely on the works of Jesus. When one believes in what Jesus did, they're saved. It says in Romans 9 through 10, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, 
resulting in salvation. In verse 13, he says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Then there's also this idea here of the life. That he's the way, the truth, and the life. One is this idea of eternal, of eternal life. You know, relationship we have with God. As Christians, there's wonderful hope and assurance and joy found when we look at eternal life. But I want to point out that this idea of eternal life isn't the idea that I come to Jesus just for I don't have to die and be damned. That is not what salvation is about. It's not a get out of hell free card. The joy in salvation is whom we spend it with. The joy of eternal life is whom we spend it with. The joy of salvation is that we get a true and authentic relationship with our creator. And it's for all who believe, who confess, who admit they are sinners. Believe God is God, that Jesus is who he says he is. And confess him as Lord and Savior of our life. Believe. Respond. It's a from this day forward gospel. So it doesn't matter about what you did in the past, but it matters what you're doing now. It's also eternal purpose here. He says, truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So when you talk about these greater works, this is the question I have to ask you. What are you called to do by God? What is your purpose? The universal purpose that we're called to be heralds of the the good news. But I think how we do that is unique to us. What is your shape? Who God made you? Who did God make you do? What is your unique purpose? And are you fulfilling it? Al, you going out in the community, mowing lawns, how you do your business, how you talk to people, the love you show them, is much you proclaiming the good news as me doing this from the stage. How we live our life, how we're shaped, the purpose we live It's found in what God has called you to do and how you live your life. So are you fulfilling your purpose of proclaiming the good news? And are you fulfilling your unique purpose that God has called you to do? There's also eternal love. We have the love of the Savior. God loved us so much he took upon your sin. He was willing to humble himself to the form of man, as Philippians 2 tells us. And why, though? He did it because we could never be restored by ourselves. He... We had, a, we had to have a perfect sacrifice, and none of us met that criteria. So in his love, he came to die in our stead. You are beloved. He loves you so much, and he's calling you into an eternal relationship to be a child of God adopted by a creator, a new life from this day forward. So there has to be a response on our part, though, as we look at this love. It says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So I want to stress this. Obedience is not the way we earn God's love because it's already been given to us unconditionally, but is the way we respond to love that has been given to us. If we love God, then you will desire to have a relationship with him, grow closer to him, do what he's called you to do, and obey what he has told you. It says in 14, 23 through 24, Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make it our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. Jesus lays it out clearly here. If you truly love him and you know him, you have a relationship with him, you will desire to obey and keep his commandments. But I want to put this here, and this is going to be a very bold statement. And I don't apologize if it offends you, because it's the Bible. Those who willingly rebel without conviction need to look hard and check their relationship status with God. Because if you are sinning and you are not feeling conviction, it's a good indication that you might not have a relationship with him. Because he said here, if you don't obey me, you're not his. That's not saying that your faith is based on works, but it's saying that if you're not responding to the love he's given you, there's something wrong there. 
There's something wrong. It's an indication. He says, if you remain in me, as we're going to say next week, he says, if you remain in me, my fruit will be produced in you. So a relationship with God is what produces godliness. Godliness does not produce a relationship with God. But if you have a relationship with God, godliness is being produced. And if you are pursuing the wickedness of this world, and you are doing so without conviction, and you are doing so and not having any worry in the world, you need to check your relationship status. If you love God, then you will desire to have a relationship with him. Grow closer to him. Do what he's called you to do. Obey him. But if you are willingly rebelling, your fruit shows who you remain in. So will you remain in him or will you remain in the world? Then lastly, there's this loving fellowship. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read the verses associated with this. It's 20 through 21. But he says that if I'm in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you. There's this wonderful story in Luke 15 called the prodigal son. It's a parable, so Jesus made this story up. But it's about this young man who came to his father and said, I want my inheritance now. The significance of that is the young man is saying, Father, to me you're dead. He goes off to a foreign land, and he squanders everything. He finds himself in a place where now he's, uh, now he's feeding pigs to try to make ends meet, and he's even wishing that he could eat the food that he was feeding the pigs. He's so poor. And he comes to this moment of realization that if he just went home, his dad's servants eat better than he does. So he makes that decision to return home. And it says, as he's returning home, the father saw him from afar. That means the father was actively looking for him. And the father goes and he runs to him. And he embraces his son. He restores him. He puts a ring on his finger, the best clothes, kills the fattened animal, and has a celebration. So he's restored to a place of sonship, even though he rejected his father. Another thing to understand that story is, if the father had not gone and embraced him, when he saw him, when he, soon as the son got to the gate of the town, he would have been banished by the town elders. So the father saved him from damnation. In this story, we are the prodigal. God is the father. We are his beloved. You know, you might have rejected him in the past, but again, it's, from, it's a from this day forward way of life. He is calling you into a relationship. He is calling you into a closer relationship. He is running to you before those can condemn you at the gate. Will you respond and come into a loving and eternal relationship with God, a fellowship? Or will you remain hopeless without a way to God? Everyone's a dead man or woman walking, as we say, talked about today in the song, awaiting eternal damnation because the wages of sin is death. And you have afflicted this on yourself, but it's your choice if it becomes concrete. Because he says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So as we come to the end here, these are my questions for you. Do you believe the way? Do you believe Jesus is the only way? Are you willing to admit Jesus is God, believe that he is who he said he is? That God raised him from the dead, that he is the Messiah, God incarnate, and confess him Lord and Savior of your life? Do you understand that you are relying on him for salvation? Will you believe with your heart? Believing and surrendering fully reliance on him, not ourselves. Your mind. Believing he is the truth. He is the way. And will you live that out in your life? Will your life reflect what you're proclaiming? Will you find comfort and hope? Believing in God, in Jesus, that he is the way. He is the truth. We know he's God, one with God. We know his, his words are true. So he is the only way to restoration. So will you base your belief on the absolute truth of Jesus? And will you, Do you desire eternal life, a relationship, love with the Father? And God's amazing love, he came to take your sins upon him so that we could believe on him and be restored to a relationship with him. Will you believe? But belief requires a response. Again, when Peter stepped out of the boat, it was responding to his faith he had put in Jesus. So what is the response? Is it eternal life with your creator? Because he's knocking at the door asking you, will you answer? 
Maybe you need to refocus and commit today. Why wait? Maybe God is laying a purpose on your heart of what he's called you to do in this world. A wonderful divine purpose that is his, that he crafted you for alone. A unique purpose that only you can fulfill in this world. It's time to respond. Guys, thanks again for joining us today. If you've made a decision today and you would like to talk to someone about it, or if you'd just like more information, go ahead and text the number below, and we'd be happy to contact you and have a conversation with you about what's going on. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a great day.